Hello and welcome to Entertainment Weekly's What to Watch, the show where EW staff help you solve your viewing dilemmas. I'm your host, Jared Hall, and joining me in my Brady Bunch style grid are staff writer Chancellor Agar, digital writer Marine Lee Linker, and correspondent Ruth Kinane. Hi, everyone. So nice to see you. This week sees the premiere of the third season of the beloved criminal minded dark comedy Search Party. But instead of getting weekly installments of the misadventures of Dory and her crew on TBS, the entire season is uh, going to drop on HBO Max, which is where you can also watch the first two seasons. Now, Chance, do you think this new season will uh, benefit from the, the binge-friendly approach? Oh, definitely. I think, I mean, the be- the good thing about Search Party is that on the one hand, it's very episodic, uh, meaning the, you know, the episodes feel like episodes. You know, it's not mm-hmm. a 10-hour movie, or I guess in this case, a five-hour movie because it's half-hour comedy. At the same time, though, we, each episode you want to keep watching ahead because it ends on a cliffhanger or a twist of some sort this season relating to Dory and her boyfriend Drew being on trial for a murder they mm-hmm. committed accidentally in the first season um so i definitely think the binge model is definitely uh will work really well for the show also just the fact that it's on hbo max i think it's a way better platform for it i mean i think when you talk to the cast uh like i talked i spoke to alia shot that uh about a month ago and she was saying how when they were on tbs they were like do do, do people know that we exist like critics <laughs> like it but is anyone actually watching the show and they hope with it being on hbo max now people will have a place to watch because that, that was the other thing too like there was no place to stream search party when it was out of season either um for those first right. two seasons so having an hbo max i think is a benefit for the show in many ways now if you're looking to watch something with the kids this weekend be them small or big kids search party might not be your first choice <laughs> but luckily disney plus has you covered with into the unknown that's a six-part series it's taking us behind the scenes of the making of Frozen 2. Now, Maureen, obviously kids are immediately on board for anything and everything that's related to Frozen, but uh, do you think this series will be informative for adults who might not know how much work goes into creating an animated movie? Animated films are probably one of the most complicated art forms when it comes to filmmaking. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people realize how much work goes into them and that it takes years and years and years and you can be working on one animated film for three to five years or longer just because every frame is being built from scratch, whether it's being drawn by hand or done in a computer. Do you think there's such thing as frozen oversaturation? Because obviously (laughs) uh, there was a lot of... uh, you know, uh, do you want to build a snowman and let it go after the first one? And then uh, the second movie became the biggest, I believe, worldwide animated <laughs> movie of all time. So is there such thing as frozen oversaturation? You know, I don't, that's hard to say. I mean, for me personally, I think we could do with some chilling out on the frozen front. <laughs> ah, <laughs> pun intended. Yes, but. totally. <laughs> Whether or not you love or hate frozen, um, I think it gives you an appreciation for the level of work and intensity and care that went into this process. So no matter if you're a little bit oversaturated with it or not, I think the documentary is really a great addition to it because it gives you such a different perspective on it. You know, The Mandalorian, they did uh, a docu-series for now this one with End of the Unknown. So um, do you think these docu-series are kind of like the new DVD extras? (laughs) Yeah, I feel like that's a really good way of looking at it. I I think that this is a great way to approach that, having these kind of making of documentaries on streaming platforms. And I hope that places that aren't Disney also sort of take up that banner because, you know, those of us that are cinephiles and TV nerds, (laughs) I, I... I know I can never get enough of content like this. Uh, that's why I became a journalist. I love to know the behind the scenes stories of all this stuff. Uh, Ruth, is, is there a Disney property, a movie that you would love to see the behind the scenes making of? Um, I would want to throw it back all the way to Aladdin because that's actually my favorite just mm. because I feel like Robin Williams in that booth doing all the, uh. I feel, I think the story is that he just like ad-libbed for hours and I would love yeah. to just see, maybe it's just that, maybe they released just him <laughs> ad-libbing <laughs> in a booth for like 12 hours or whatever it was. Chance, what's, uh, what's the, the Disney property for you that you want to know and see more about? I mean, similar to Ruth, uh, going all the way back to, uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is my favorite Disney movie. I think it's criminally mm. underrated. I think Hunchback is a creepy 
and dark as hell movie, but really interesting. And I would love to just like to know like what was going through people's minds when they released this movie because like the movie is like I get why people don't like it. it. Like it's there's again Hellfire is about this like clergyman lusting after um, Esmeralda, which is really creepy. Yeah. Um, and I just want to know like what was going through their minds as they were <laughs> composing this. I, I personally think it's like I think it's Alan Menken's best music too. Um, that's all just because it's very operatic, which is what I like. And so I would again, I would love to know all about that. Yep. Uh, Maureen, lastly, what's your pick? Uh, so I would actually go live action as opposed to animation. And I would want to pair the 1960s Parent Trap with the 1990s Ooh, Parent Trap because yes. I love them both equally. And I think it'd be really fun to learn the histories behind them, but also like how Nancy Myers was inspired by the original and wanted to bring pieces of it into the story while also making it her own. The, that, that's all, of course, on topic with uh, Frozen 2. I got to say, they got really lucky that they had a song called Into the Unknown because it just works so perfectly uh, <laughs> for the name of this docuseries too. Uh, but it is time for us to go into the known because we know we've got to take a quick break but unlike wait for frozen three this one's going to be over in no time we'll be right back welcome back despite the fact that we've all had more time at home to catch up on shows the past few months we are still in peak tv so some new shows might have flown under your radar. That's all right. We're here to help. Ruth, you and I have talked uh, a lot about how much we love the Hulu show Normal People that premiered yes. back in April when a lot of our minds were on other things. But what is it for you about this show that really did it? This is a really weird answer, but it hurts. It really hurts to watch this show in like the best possible way because yes. it's this like Ruth. very... F <laughs> this is this very <laughs> epic love story, but like told quietly. Like, Chance thinks I'm going somewhere else with this, but I'm getting there. But it's it's you come away from it and you you are like it sits with you. You really feel yeah. the struggles this couple goes through. You know, I, I really love the article that you wrote. It was uh, seven reasons normal normal people isn't your normal TV romance, and and mm -hmm. the first one really I think encapsulates it for me. There aren't a million grand declarations of yes. love. Did you guys see that Winona Ryder said she's watched the entirety of Normal People three times because she loves it wow. so much? <laughs> I've done it a couple of times. But... And you talked about the authenticity. Uh, we can't not talk about uh, all of the sex scenes, which yeah. sex is sex, fine. But they uh, these scenes are filmed so authentically. Um, and it's they all... just kind of, they go there. They um, yep. let everything <laughs> literally hang out. <laughs> I, I mean, you're not, you're not wrong. There is full frontal nudity in this, fully, yeah. But that's, yeah. again, what's great about it. Some of those scenes are, like, 10 minutes long, and they have every awkward fumble, them trying to take their clothes off and, like, getting caught, and, like, they're breathing, and it just feels very realistic. So for uh, the rest of you, um, do you have any, like, other hidden gems, things that have kind of been released in the past couple months? Yeah, well, so for me talking about these behind the scenes Disney properties, I really loved uh, Prop Culture, which debuted uh, it's on- It's so good. All right, I love it so much. It's kind of those like making of documentaries specifically focused on props and costumes in miniature because each episode is one film or franchise. So they have the first episodes, Mary Poppins, they do Pirates of the Caribbean, and this guy who is a real collector goes on these journeys to track down what's happened to props and costumes from these really iconic Disney films. Uh, and then the best part of the show is that he then brings them back and shows them to the people who created them or worked with them in meaningful ways in the films. All right, Chance, what's that show for you? Not to be a parody of myself by, 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 like, by recommending another superhero show, but um, as I did last time, but DC Stargirl... <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, it's a show that I was excited for. It's um, it's show run by Jeff Johns, who created the character in the '90s, based off his sister who died tragically in a plane crash. And it's just uh, it's it's airing on CW and DC Universe, and it's about this uh, high schooler named Courtney who discovers this cosmic staff that belonged to the superhero Starman, who was a member of the Justice Society of America. Turns out her new stepfather was his was his uh, sidekick, and hence why he has the staff. And so she like picks up the staff and becomes a superhero star girl. The one that I think the high school setting helps differentiate it from pretty much every other superhero show on television. You get these scenes that at least even having loved Smallville that like you never really saw in Smallville because in Smallville they, was, they were always so timid about 
being too superhero because it was before we sort of really embraced that, especially on TV. And now it's like the, the um, uh, Courtney sets about sort of rebuilding the Justice, the Justice Society of America. And she starts recruiting some of her fellow classmates at, at her new school. And there's just like scenes where she's just like, where they're like trying on their super suits in her bedroom. And it's like this weird <laughs> mix of like a sleepover scene with like a, uh, with a superhero twist on it that's really really cool that's a great pick great recommendation uh, like you said uh dc universe it's on mondays and then the cw on tuesdays so uh, a couple places to catch that one well you guys uh that's our show uh, my thanks to our guest chancellor agar maureen lee linker and ruth canane we are taking next week off for the fourth of july holiday where i'll be spending my weekend watching hamilton on repeat yeah. on Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> guys we'll see you in two weeks on what to watch. Bye. Bye.